Hi, everybody. So you may have noticed uh, that I forgot to hit record at the beginning of today's class, and so I missed a little bit of the initial part. In particular, I missed my introduction of today's guest speaker and uh, his, um, his initial remarks for his first slide. So I'm going to try to recreate at least my introduction here. Uh, you're going to see a gap uh, in the video, obviously. My, uh, my um, video editing skills are somewhat limited, but anyway, we do what we can do. So our speaker today is Garrett Zaman uh, from Simeo, and Garrett is in charge of the digital twin solution, both from the development side and the um, services side. And Garrett has a long history of working in this area, in the area of uh, scheduling, enterprise planning, and integration, leading into uh, Industry 4.0. And so the idea here is to get a bigger picture of what we've been working on all semester. We focus primarily on uh, pretty simplified implementation, so on the Simeo modeling side. And what I hope to achieve here is that Garrett will be able to provide you an expect, uh, a perspective of where this fits in uh, and how it's useful. So again, you're going to hear a little gap here uh, because I don't have Garrett's first part, um, but um, bear with me. I added a smart factory of the future, but you know, for a lot of for factories that is still in the future, right? So I'll, I'll try and address both the current sort of issues that companies are st struggling with right now, as well as where we go into the future. Now, um, just from um, an agenda perspective, I'll do a quick intro. Then what is Sosemio? Who are, are they? What is Industry 4.0? Um, I'm sure you all know, but just from a, a, a definition from a planning and a scheduling perspective, then sort of the planning and scheduling challenges that companies are facing. What is the Simeo digital twin? Let's describe the solution in simple terms and then look at some of how you will deploy and connect such a digital twin in an operational environment and perhaps touch on some case studies as well. Now, I'm Gerrit Zeman, and as you can probably hear from my accent, I was not born and raised in the United States. So for you not to think for the next um, hour, where on earth is this man from? I will tell you. I'm uh, from South Africa and spent uh, about 48 years there and then moved to the United States where I am now the last 14 years. So if you can do your maths, you will know how, how old I am. Um, very successful, moved here as a family, now citizens of the United States. Both my sons went to college here, both went through medical school, and they both in residency. Right now, one in dermatology and one in anesthesiology. So I, I, I also walked the path with my kids through the college system here and uh, have some appreciation for, for that. Now, I, I started out with simulation literally in the late 80s with um, the, the uh, um, founder and current CEO of Simeo had a company then called Systems Modeling and developed a product called Simon, uh, and then later Arena. And, and I represented that in South Africa and established one of the first sort of corporate agreements in simulation with companies like Anglo-American, which is one of the world's largest mining companies, Sassol, which is the largest coal to fuel company in the world, um, Steel, which uh, Isco Steel, which later became part of Tata Steel. So um, a, a, a lot of work in that space and then joined I2 Technologies. Now, uh, some of you might know I2, some not, but they were until about 10 years ago, the largest sort of supply chain com company in the world. Um, they dominated the space. They became $1.2 billion. And, 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 and I, I managed the, the office or the, uh, in, in Southern Africa um, for I2. Then moved to the United States and spent some time at Softion, which is a warehouse management company. So I've got some exposure as to scheduling and optimization of warehouse operations. And then seven years ago, joined Simeo and is now VP of the Manufacturing Digital Twin Space for Simeo. So um, just a little bit of background. I've learned in the United States that 
um, people like to know who you are and where you come from. So, um, so that's that. So just from a Simeo perspective, Simeo at a glance, just very quickly headquartered in Pittsburgh and focuses on design to operate simulation-based software technology for manufacturing with two focuses. The one is sort of the time and process simulation for the design or predictive, um, predictive sort of science, if you will. And then the, the digital to and for operations, which is the planning and scheduling side. Now, this is really 30 years of innovation by the same core group, right? So Dr. Dennis Pegden, which I think Jeff knows extremely well for also about 25, 30 years, um, Jeff. Um, and, and, and he really developed the very first discrete event package called SLAM with a, a partner, I think another professor called uh, Pritzker. Um, but they then split ways and he developed Simon. And then Cinema was, was really the first animation to go with simulation. Um, he then developed Arena that really became the global benchmark. And it was, it was really the standard worldwide used in all of the colleges and un un universities and was acquired by Rockwell Automation and is still sold today by Rockwell. But uh, Dr. Pigden and his core development team then started Simeo about 12 or so years ago and developed a sort of fourth generation data generated and driven digital twin solution for design and operation, right? And it's really ground, groundbreaking. Uh, some key partnerships with you know, Microsoft, Aviva MES, Manufacturing Execution System, PTC Capware for real-time in integration to IoT devices, and SAP. We've got a real-time integration through the SAP cloud integration platform to SAP. A big consulting firms like McKenzie, EY, Accenture, Genpack, um, you know, promotes users, have practices built around Simeo. And then just like you guys, it's taught in about 1,300 universities in about 60 countries we've just about replaced arena everywhere right uh, there's still there's still some arenas strong elves there but we you know working on that and it really applies to any any industry right any process but our focus has shifted a little bit to be more manufacturing centric right although it, it can fit any um in, in industry from a smart manufacturing or industry 4.0 perspective, we're sort of focusing on, on manufacturing. All right, so let, let's um, look at just some, just for you as an idea of some of our, our, our key customers, very strong in aerospace and defense. Um, you know, the Lockheed Martins of the world, Northrop Grumman, all the space vehicles that goes to space like the, uh, the new Web Atlas telescope was all built by the facility using Simeo to schedule daily schedules 52 weeks in advance every day. Uh, about 400 to 500,000 tasks per day scheduled daily for 52 weeks, right? So really powerful stuff. Um, the largest consumer packaged goods, Procter and Gamble, number one, Colgate. Um, in nuclear, nu nuclear with the um, um, manufacture of nuclear fuel, um, um, and, and and so forth in metals and mining, so a large footprint. All right, so let's let's look at sort of the definition. The Forbes definition is like two or three years old, but I, I still like this definition because it say, says Industry 4.0 optimizes the computerization of industry 3.0. So what that means is that during the industry 3.0 revolution, everybody was supposed to computerize all of their systems. Now that didn't happen, right? Because not some factories have very old ERP systems. Some have no manufacturing execution systems. Some have no sort of monitoring and track and trace systems. Some do their whip collection by hand in an Excel sheet. So, you know, and that's why I'm saying if we say smart factory of the future, we're not there because a lot of folks 
like fell asleep at the wheel during industry 3.0, right? Now, a key point here is that now and into the future, as this unfolds, computers are connected and communicate with one another to ultimately make decisions without human involvement. So this, this is a very key point that I will focus on a little bit. Is this thing called a human, right? So today, basically, factories cannot run without, without you, you humans. Not to do the work, not, not only to do the work, but to figure out what to do next, right? So um, al although you might think that there's very smart systems and we have AI and we have all these wonderful things, today when there's a schedule, a planner produces a schedule to run a factory, it is a human in Excel that does so, right? It, it, it like boggles your mind, but it's absolutely true. 95% of any sort of semi-complex semi or complex factory you walk into, if you find the planner, if you say, please find me the guy that plans and schedules this factory, if you find him and you say, what software do you use to create the schedule with to go to the shop floor for execution, the answer will be Excel, right? It is, it is, it is um, mind boggling, but it's true. And then ultimately, it's this network of these machines that are digitally connected to one another to create and share inform information that is the true power. Now, in any team, if you've got a football team, if you've got a, you know, any team, there needs to be an orchestrator right, or a captain. So one of these machines that need to be digitally connected must be a digital twin that has the capability to understand what all the machines are doing, what is coming, what is on the floor, what is in the buffer and decide on a task level by item, by resource, what to do next, right? And that is the digital twin, right? So I'll touch on this a little bit more as we go. Now, to complicate things more, it's just not a question of industry 4.0 in the smart factory, but a lot of things has happened as well, right? The first one here is because of lean, lean and Six Sigma and all of these good things, people have leaned out the supply chains because there's a lot of cost that sits in the supply chain. And, and the factories has become the de facto response buffers. Now, in an environment where you make a handful of SKUs, you make blue ones, green ones, red ones, and you can have lines dedicated to running those things, that's okay, right? But the, the next point here made that particularly challenging to say, well, we've dramatically increased product variety and configurability, which means I can now configure what I want, right? So Dell started out with this like 20 years ago that said, you can buy a desktop and you can, you can pick the case, you can pick the motherboard, the hard drive, the mouse, you know, the whole thing, and we'll take your order and you'll pay for it before it's even built. And, and Dell pioneered that to this sort of specific configurable item down to one, right? So you can, you can pick this, the specific item you want. And, and, and they sort of started to spoil the market with that. What has also happened, smaller order, minimum order quantities, right? So this ideal of the smart factory of the future is say the batch quantity of one, right? Or batch quantity of one. So for most factories today, that is like impossible because they are set up for mass production. We work with a company that makes diapers those big machines makes 20 diapers a second. The machine that cuts the, the, the material runs at 30 G. Um, you know, it is a blur. You, you cannot even see the diapers move. And they make, they run the same line on the same brand and size for 14 days. Now, if you say, hey, guys, guys, I, I, I want to have a 12 pack of this, with blue tabs and, and, and that whole thing comes apart, right? Because to change that machine takes hours. It takes you know, a few hours just to ramp up to speed and to ramp down and, and, and. So a lot of the factories simply will struggle to, to, to cope in this sort of in, environment. And because of this, the operations have now improved, increased in complexity, right? And Amazon has spoiled the world, right? The fourth point here, is 
they they made us all believe that you can get everything in 48 hours and if you're lucky the next day and there's some folks that says the same day and i'm i'm in in dallas te texas and i'm in plano and in plano you know there's some of the pharmacies that delivers your prescription drugs in two hours by drone now right so my goodness i can put in my order now and two hours later something arrives and there's there's my stuff right take that back to batch sizes of th thousands lead times of weeks um you know the, the world has now become extremely complex which the, the last point here those humans right so today what keeps the factories running are those humans that's been there if you go to europe people work at the same factory for 25 30 plus years right they they go there they have an internship and they retire there they know that place inside out and they know exactly what how to run what machine what to go where what to do to fix an issue and and and, and those people are leaving the station they are leaving the bus they're getting off the bus right so the reliability on systems and 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 not being reliant on humans is just getting more and more and more right now if we look at the sort of typical scheduling reality you might walk into a factory and there might be any or all of these systems or more of them and typically i've just used some brand names here you know sap is a very pop popular one your know, erp systems there's might be an mes manufacturing execution quality system plot plant maintenance lab systems you know there might be databases that people set up things like you know operator skill sets and so forth you might have some automation equipment if it's a sophisticated factory they might have some iot um, e equipment machines that you can di directly access get status give instructions to but there's always some spreadsheets somewhere in a corner right now but that's what is what's great is you know it gives you data you know and you know a lake of data and that's why they put up data lakes right and that's just a joke so there's all this data but unfortunately it's fantastic but it's also not right because this data is not correlated they're not at the same level of detail they don't carry the same timestamp. the values are the different right so if you, you you guys are all i think using simulation and one of the first things you ask when something goes to a machine is what is the processing time so if you go to the erp system and you say what is the processing time for this type of product they say oh well we have an average of this time and this average time include an average for change over okay well thank you very much you go to the mes system and you say what is the processing time and he says well it depends it depends on what machine it runs on and and and, and but in average it's it's this amount of minutes and that is different from what you just heard from the erp and then you walk across the room to the planner in his excel sheet and you say what what time do you use for pro processing time he said oh well it depends on the machine the material the size of the hole what operator is on the machine today and, and and i've got whole spreadsheets because every item that i drill carries a different rate so now you're completely confused right because what time do you use and this is where the humans come in with the excel sheets right because they are the only people that can take all of this and turn it into a schedule that they send to the factory floor which then another set of humans take and really make it work on the fly on the factory floor and 95 percent of factories that you walk into today will work like that it, it is mind-boggling but it is the truth so so if you go to a factory and you ask the management um what are you guys looking for right you you say you've got you want to you want to become a smart factory you want to improve throughput you want to be more dynamic and agile what do you want to achieve and and the answer is almost all the same we want to reduce things we want to reduce work in, in the system we want to reduce oh over time unplanned downtime and, and so forth and we absolutely want to increase asset asset utilization throughput oee or all of those great things 
We want to eliminate synchronization delays, lost sales, penalties, and so forth. And we want to improve on time, material management, and so forth. And, and then you say, okay, well, that sounds good. But can you guys tell me what is the true capacity of the factory given the current product mix and operational configuration? And the, the answer is, geez, we have no idea. Right? We have no idea. We know the plant is designed for 60,000 units a week. We're running at about 42, 45, and we really don't know where the other 15 has gone, right? And this is right here, what I mentioned just now, this increase in SKUs, smaller batches, deliveries, more changeovers, specific skills now to run these more sophisticated machines. And they simply don't know, right? Now, this leads then to this issue which, which is coined the hidden factory, where the corporate sits there and they have their SAP or the ERP system. And I'm not, not blaming any system. It's just how, how it works today. Um, and, and, and they say, well, this is our forecast. This is the capacity we have. We have 60,000 units. We, we know that the material will be available at that time. We have so many resources and so forth. You know, this is what we should make. On the other hand, is the real factory, right? The actual factory. And there they say, well, you know, we have breakdowns, we have changeovers and setups, we have maintenance, you know, we have we have quality issues and so forth. Every day is a struggle to just get by the next 48 hours. And the management says, well, there's there's something up with the factory. We need to train them more. We need to, we need to do something. We need to fire some people because they never meet the planned volumes that we make. And in the middle is the poor scheduler supervisors and operators with Excel that tries to make, make all of this work. And this is, this is just a reality in factories today. And, and you'll say, well, what have this all got to do with Simeo? So then you go a little bit further before I get to Simeo and say, what is the, what is the, some of the practices and constraints with planning and scheduling? And I'll, 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 I've got two examples here, a simple one, and then I'll, I'll try and go down a little bit more d d detail. So let's just say, and, and this is based on an actual example we did of, of a company what, this is one of the largest manufacturers of power transformers in the world. This is massive transformers that goes into the power stations and into the distribution net networks. These things are almost the size of a house. Um, they are huge, last, uh, large, they oil cooled, um, you know, massive things. And, and let's say somebody orders, it's a, it's, it's an, order for one of these transformers and it's got three extra large coils right so xl coils the large coils let's just for simplicity's sake say it takes 24 hours of winding per coil per winding machine so these winding machines are huge things that turns these coils each of these coils are the side size of about an f-150 truck or more um, and and, and they only work five days a week, right? so no weekends. So just a very simple example based on some, something that we actually did. So if we look at the constraints at a simple level, there's this winding machines, right? It's the winders. And there's three of them, right? There's three of them. But then you need a mandrel to wind the coil on that bolts onto this, this winding machine. And you need an operator with a specific skill set based on the type of coil, right? So if it's an extra large coil, there's an operator required that's certified. And a lot of these certifications, some of them are three months, six months, some of them are a year. When it comes to things like welding, it's like three months. So this whole skill thing and who are certified to work is, is, a, is a huge issue. And then there's the shift schedules that the operators run. So almost all of the ERP capacity planning systems based work on a work center basis that says there's a winding work center with a capacity of three, which means 
if I schedule it from a capacity planning point of view in my ERP system to determine what can my factory make, I say, okay, on Monday, I can run coil one on winder one, coil two on winder two, and coil three on winder three. Fantastic. Tuesday, I can put the coils, I can, I can marry the coils in the course. Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We require a mandrel. Okay, but that is a secondary resource that is not part of the routing. The routing in the ERP says go to the winding machine with a capacity of three. What do you mean a mandrel? Well, we only have two. One is in for reconditioning. Okay, that means we have to run coil one on one, coil two on two, and coil three only the next day. So now we can do the core assembly uh, only on Wednesday. Okay, but there's another catch here. We only have one operator certified for extra large coils, which means we can run the coils on three consecutive days, and we can only start the coil assembly on Thursday. But then we say, okay, but this operator only worked day shift. Ooh. Now, suddenly, something that would have started on Tuesday is only going to start the next Tuesday due to only three more secondary constraints, right? Which causes this disconnect between what management think the factory can make, this hidden factory principle, and what the factory can actually make. Right now, now this is very simplistic, so I'm going to just go a little bit further and say, well, Let's say there's a drilling op operation. It's simple, right? So in an ERP system, I've got a drilling work center with the capacity of five. Oh, but it's not as simple. If you go to the floor, there's two machines that are dedicated for large holes, bigger than half an inch. Um, or, or, I mean, yeah, and, and there's two for small holes, you know, slower. There's one that can draw any size. It's an old machine and it's fairly slow. So that's now interesting catch. Oh, but that's not all. For every hole we drill, we have to, to train, we have to change the rig with the drill in and and and. And there's a change over time. But also based on the material, we cannot clamp stainless steel and plastic with the same clamp because it damages the, the plastic. So we can have like two changeovers that can happen either in parallel or series, depending on what it is. Oh, but there's also three operator types. You might be certified in one machine or both machines or three machines. So based on the shift schedule, we might not be able to run all the machines, right? And there's another catch, you know, based on the machine type, the rate difference, based on the size of the hole, the rate is different. The material type, the hole is specific and also the thickness, right? So, so when the order arrives at the machine and I see it's this, this big hole, it's this thick, it's stainless steel, it's this machine. Only then do I know what is my rate, right? And then, oh, we're doing maintenance on these machines as well, so they're not always available. And again, this is not all of the constraints that we deal with. So now all of these systems are resource calendar-based with optimization, right? So they run these optimizers to, to optimize the calendars on the primary equipment producing an optimized plan that is not feasible, right? So, and, and hence, the, so now we say, okay, okay, we want to run a smart factory with equipment, ro robotic equipment or autonomous mobile robots with AGVs and humans with smart glass on. Nobody's making this, you know, going to decide what to do. How do we do that, right? So, the challenge here, just as a large uh, slide, today, how the world works is the demand planning that says this is what we need, this is the orders we get. Um, if it's a consumer goods company, they say, well, Walmart and all of these big retailers give us demand, we decide what it is, we do a, a network plan, and we then do the production demand by factory of the, the unhidden factory, like the one we think we have. Then we send it to the factory. The factory creates a schedule and says, uh-oh, I can't make that. Right? It sends it back in the supply chain and the supply chain fails, stock out on the shelves. Everybody's upset and they don't know why. Right? Now, the issue is they, they don't know what they don't know. Right? They don't know why they cannot get the capacity to the factory that is made for 60,000 units a week and they only make 45. Right? Now, once you get the factory right, and, and that's where we're going to go next, Right, then your supply chain, everything should be hunky dory, barring any you know, issues or catastrophes or whatever the case might be. 
So let's switch gears now and say, right, what is Simeo, the factory digital twin, right? Now the 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 intent is that it's 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 a two-step approach, almost regardless whether it's green fields or brown fields, because even if the factory exists, that notion of we don't know why we cannot get the throughput means we have to go back and model it first and understand what is the issues, what can we change process wise, equipment wise, and determine what is your throughput given a certain product mix. And we can do it either from a brown fields or a green field sort of um, you know, uh, uh, approach and do the design of the factory, right? So you know, how do we understand the true capacity, design the factory, do what it's supposed to do in the first place. And we're now doing some really excited work with um, some you know, innovative companies where the factory does not exist, but we design it for digital, right? So this whole concept of design for digital, to say we're going to look at every task that every resource is going to perform, every material that it's going to require, we're going to decide where the data is going to come from, whether it's going to come from the ERP or the MES. We're going to decide what is the, the, the serial number of that task. We're going to synchronize on the processing time of the task, the resource requirements, the secondary resources, the cart or the transport device that we're going to use. So we create now a digital twin based on a data template of that archetype even before the factory is built, right? It's really fascinating stuff. You then move across and say, okay, so now once we go into production, we connect now our cables, not to our design data sources in, anymore, but to the actual data sources and we schedule the factory, right? So now we can do this end-to-end -end synchronization and scheduling for labor, tooling, material capacity, the whole thing. Because this is stochastic, engine we can run a risk assessment of this as well right and we can create true transparency to the impact of business rules and i touch on that a little bit more to get to a point where we can do autonomous operation right because now these events are communicated to the digital twin in near real time the digital twin run from time now forward in time and writes back to all of these systems what the next task is right now it can be a, a a tablet in a forklift or in a truck right where we we write back in a smart device which we're doing um we have a a big aluminium factory um and, and it's one of the case studies in the slide deck where based on the crucible temperature right 900 degrees is like the critical Tem the temperature so if any crucible falls below 900 that goes to the top of the priority list for pickup so the truck driver might be driving to drop off the the next you know task and as he's driving his second task changes without him even knowing that or why right so he just follows the process. Um, so real exciting stuff where this one model from a design for digital perspective becomes the operational model also facilitating continuous improvement because you still have your sandbox on the left that just with a click of a button is promoted to being the operational model, right? So that's the beauty of this. There's no re-implementation, configuration, anything. You just push the current model into operation. And I'll show that a little bit more as well. So the solution in simple terms, designing of the factory as I described. Important point here, both from a design for di digital or whether it's existing, is that that model must be connected to, generated from, and driven by data. Why is that important? If you have a model, that require a modeler to jump in there every time somebody adds a resource, adds a new material, change routing, change something to a bill of material, adds a new customer, then it will be a constant sort of um, exercise, right? So 
all of these digital twin models are generated from data. So the model reflects the data in the ERP or the enterprise systems. If anybody goes in, adds a customer, the customer is in the model. If he adds a new material and Sumio refreshes, that new material is on the item master in the bill of material and part of the next the routing, right? So the model must be auto adaptive to the environment unless the environment drastically changed, right? So they, they build, break down some walls and change the whole flow, you know, and, uh, and so forth. But, but for regular sort of run of operation changes, the model must be automatically adapt to the environment. Now, once you have this model now, it can run and generate a schedule in near real time, right? So depending on the time horizon that you're looking at, if you create the next shift, it must literally run in 20, 30 seconds, right? It's hard to get it to run f faster than that. If it, if it runs next week, it must be in the five to 10 minute range. And if it runs the next six months, you know, it's in a 20 minute range, but it's the near term that matters in a smart factory environment, right? So this a couple of seconds, 10, 15, 20 second response for an event, right? A forklift gets stuck. Something was in its way. What is the next best talk to do? Or you know, a forklift, an AGV. So AGV one was supposed to arrive first. But now because it's stuck, because some, something crossed its path, AGV2 is going to arrive first. Or, or, so how do I change my flow based on this change in event, right? You cannot just stop the whole factory. Now, we then, once the schedule is produced, that task list and material requirements list gets sent down. Worst case, on a piece of paper, right, on a clipboard, or to a smart device, or even better, directly to the device itself, right? Sometimes the device is an operator console through the MES equipment, or sometimes it is the device itself through an MQQT um, you know, link through PPTC capware directly to the equipment as to the task, right? Um, and then, you know, you can do this continuous improvement improvement by understanding the performance versus actual go back update your model and run the sequence again and fine tune this factory to where it runs you know as smooth as possible without things like failures and and you know the, the, the things that break or quality issues and and so forth right so why is this important now, why is this important? Why is it different than what I explained before from the existing sort of supply chain planning and enterprise you know, systems in the market right now? Because in Simeo, we can model three levels of complexity, right? The first one is the physical environment. What do I need to make this item? I need equipment, a machine, an a AGV, a mandrel, a drill, um, you know, I need a forklift, or whatever the case might be. These are hard safety rules that I must obey. And, and, and. if I don't do this, I cannot produce this part, right? And this is usually the easier side because you can touch and feel these things. You can go walk the floor, see them in action, ask questions. What is that thing? You know, what does it do? And, and you create a model that represents the factory but but that's not all right the next layer is this business rules and we almost find in every instance that there's a disconnect between the physical factory and these rules because some other people in an office somewhere else makes a lot of these rules right they are oblivious as to the impact thereof of the physical environment for instance a rule says from a safety equipment we do not want to do two change overs at the same time okay well, it sounds very good but if i have 10 lines in a building and i can only do one change over at a time it means that if one of my lines want to do a change over it has to wait and some of these change overs can take hours right it, 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 even a day and then there's some that says i cannot do more than two 
per building per day. Okay, so it means I can only change over two lines. So back to my diapers, where I've got all these size brand configurations, and I've got 10 lines, and I can only do two changeovers per building per day. It's a disaster, right? Then inventory, you know, minimum order quantities. Well, if my minimum order quantity is 10,000, but, you know, and it requires me to run for three days, but I need to change over every half a day to meet the demand, then those two things are in con contradiction, right? So we often find that the business rules are in contradiction with what the factory needs to produce and meet the orders, right? And then there's the third layer, which is really the more complex one, right? That's the invisible, that's the invisible layer because that's the tribal knowledge of those people that's in the factory for 15, 25, 30 years that makes that that takes the schedule and really makes it work. That says, oh, this machine, Joe will run that machine. These parts, no, no, no. I know if I run them on this machine, I have quite quality issues. I run them over there. And if I run these on this machine, I need to run at a lower rate. Otherwise, the drill breaks, right? The drill bit breaks. There's a lot of knowledge about the, the rules that get supplied on the shop floor, which are the hardest to capture. And I'll, I'll come back to this a, a little bit. The beauty is within a semi-digital tour, and we can capture all of these things. Because if you remember my very first slide about the industry 4.0, without human intervention, as long as we have this at the bottom, we can never get the humans out of the loop. So to run the smart factory is just not feasible, right? Now, if we look at Simeo, why is it, is it in, we, we turn the approach upside down. A, a lot of people tend to go with it with an optimization approach or an AI approach, an AI op, optimization approach. And I'll touch on that a little bit as well. But if you want to have any factory without human involvement and whatever schedule you produce, however good or bad the schedule is, it's not feasible. The schedule is useless, right? So from a similar perspective, by capturing those three levels of decision logic, we make sure that whatever schedule we pr produce, you can execute as is. Right? First, first rule of success to get to a, a better factory, a more controlled factory, and if you have any dreams of a smart factory, you have to be able to have a system that produces a feasible schedule. The next is then optimization to find the best space, best meaning what? It means different things for different people, right? Some people say, I want to use this least amount of energy. Some people say, I never want to be late, even if it costs me more. Some people say, I want to reduce cost as far as possible, even if I'm late, right? So optimization means different things. And sometimes you don't have to optimize all process, you just need to optimize the selection of a specific tank where there's flow rate constraints and temperature constraints and all sorts of constraints. And you call that optimization as part of runtime, right? And then you can also use AI because guess what? You know, Simeo has got now some AI capabilities built in where we can either generate the data to train it, or we can also train it and then use, use it as part of the decision to give us a fast decision on which tank, tank to use or which line to you know use. But the approach of Simeo is feasibility first and then improve the plan, whether you want to use the word optimization or not, that's up to you. But it's, it's a very tough word, that one, right? Because it says it cannot be any better, any better than what, right? It's, 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 I, I struggle, as you, can, as you can hear by now, with this whole notion of optimization, it, it is a misnomer, I think. And Jeff, as, as an academic, might argue with me here. But, you know, if you stand in the real factory, this word optimization is so far away, you know, it, 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 it's, it's uh, you know, you have to get to feasibility and then improve from there, right? So, so now, if we look at this whole process, right, if you step into a job world, you say, guys, this is a process, right? There's no magic bullets here there's no instant cure there's no gold, golden pill it is a process and it starts with understanding the factory whether it's a new one or an existing one analyzing understanding the root cause 
and then predicting what this factory can do. And this is typically done virtually with model with the data that represents what you expect in the future or actual data from systems about the past. And the past can be last week, right? So that you can test and run the system on actual data that has happened. Now, I don't want to pause right here because there's a, lot, a big notion that says AI, right? And AI is a wonderful thing, but there's a, a big sort of th school of thought out there that says, well, we don't need all this model building. We, we take our, our, our AI engine or alg algorithm and we feed it the existing enterprise data. And if we take our ERP system and we feed it the routings and we feed it what machines the work has been done on and, and we give it all these things, then very rapidly we have a model of the process. Well, that, that, that is absolutely correct. The only issue with that is that the enterprise data, as I said in the beginning there, is so uncorrelated, inconsistent, and purely wrong. For instance, an ERP system will typically only have the primary routing. In other words, I can make part A on machine one, but it's also possible to make it on machine two and three and four. But the ERP only carries the primary routing, right? So if you only, if your AI engine only reads the ERP data, it would not understand that it can be made on three more machines, just as a very simplistic example, right? And so it's, it's sort of hard to, to train the algorithms from the existing enterprise data. And that's where Simeo as a model. So if you, if you do nothing else with the model, if you say, I want to stop right here, and use Simeo to, to create training data from my algorithm, that's already a better place, right? But the, the next thing is, is then to say, let's now take the same model and move it across and it becomes the digital twin. Why is this concept a little different than an optimizer on AI? So an AI engine or an optimizer, I would put in, a, in what I would term a, a black box approach, right? And black not being a bad, a bad word, that black box means it's, it's bad. It just means that the planner presses a button, this thing runs, it gives him an answer, and he, he doesn't know what trade-offs were made, how important material was, if he expedited some material, will it make a difference? If he changes the resource allocation, what will happen? You know, if he changes the priority of some of these orders, because the AI engine doesn't know that, right? It just takes this set of conditions, it runs it. Now, what it can do is it can take, give it all sort of permutations and options and see what it does, but it still remains to some extent a black box. The Simio model, we sort of put in what we term in a glass box, right? So every decision logic is captured and coded in data and process logic, right? That says, well, if I do this, then that, right? If I change this operator, if I if I go from two to three of this, if I make the shift just 10 minutes longer, you know, it, it is fully transparent. If I change my business rule from this to this, if I change my minimum batch quantity from this to this, you can see the direct impact of making changes in terms of the value of throughput, of lost sales, of what, whatever it might be. Now, you run then into this data issue, right? This data issue. So it doesn't matter how hard you try in this initial phase, this virtual phase. Man, once you take your plug and you walk across and you go plug it into that ERP system, there's a bunch of worms that comes down that pipe, right? I mean, it's just, it's just a fact. People enter things incorrectly. They scan it incorrectly. They, they work on 10 things and they give the completion date or time, the same time to all 10 than the last one, right? So a lot of like practices and training and change management issues, which becomes, which pops. If, if you load this model into this glass box, it really pops. It shows you, re this is the issue. There is a material item missing. There is a bomb with, without this, you know, and so forth. Because it's, it's, it's a very complex 
materials phase in and out. They've got um, valid use dates. They've got um, yeah, expiry dates. There's, there's a lot of complexity involved in a real factory, right? And this data standardization across systems, which, which, which you know, is part of the digital transformation to the smart factory, is extremely difficult to do without this digital twin that exposes all of these flaws, right? And that's where the AI engine and the optimizer fails because it doesn't show you this, right? I mean, it has its value. Absolutely, don't, don't get me, me wrong. The, the best world at some point is the marriage of these two worlds, right? But right now, as I said to you, Industry 3.0, people were asleep at the wheel, right? They didn't get all of the, they didn't get their systems ducks in, in a row. Now, once you get the data sorted, you really get the true picture, which then runs into some of these schedule feasibility issues where some of those rules on the factory floor and, and, and you didn't capture in the virtual factory phase on the left here, right? And only once you've crossed all of these bridges can you get to autonomous or semi-autonomous work mode with even with humans involved, right? So the human might just be like a human robot where he's got smart glass on that gives him instructions either in his ear or on the glass as to what to do next. And he just follows. He doesn't make any decisions, right? He just executes. And then again, the continuous improvement capability because of this glass box approach to improve and improve and improve on these processes because it involves how you do it equipment, buffer spaces, it, it, it's a lot of things, right? Um, we are working now with companies that is automating the sort of flow of material through a factory on magnetic um, disks or carousels. These things move at, with an acceleration of 10 G, right? Um, they are accurate to like thousands of a, of a second. Um, that sort of bring to reality this notion of a batch size of one, right? Now, we're looking at a specific customer, and I, I, unfortunately, you know, I cannot mention these names, but they are making plastic toys, right? Plastic device that you, that you build. And you can configure what you want, right? So you say, I want that one. And that and these mold injection machines will sit along this highway of these magnetic carousels that can move in multiple lanes in little blocks like a chest sort of squares. And it can move forward, backward, left, right. It can move in arcs. It moves extremely fast. And you can, you can route this carousel to any machine that is available next to, to get four of these blocks, five of those blocks, the axle, the this, the that. And so if you put your order into Amazon and say, I want one of these, it triggers off the process, a carousel is initiated, it runs down this path, it collects all of the items directly out of the mold injection machine into the box, label on and out the door on its way to your front door, right? So, so that, that is sort of where we go to. Now you can start to think now, right? So I'm, set, I'm giving you this example of the other side of the coin as to why this this real-time decision-making of orchestrating the actual execution of the process is of critical importance. If there's any human that needs to think about, about it, I mean, the, the guys, I was in a call with them this morning, five milliseconds is a long time in that world, right? Five milliseconds is a long time in that world. So even going to be pressured on similar to be faster, right? So let's look at this now. We look at the same factory again and says, there's our factory we had before, but now we are at a happy place because what? We have a digital twin, right? And this digital twin now, we connect to all these data sources and we don't care what they are. And, and, and I'm sure in your, your guys' work that you've done, you connected them to Excel and you read the, the files, the, the, the data from Excel. So we can connect in through the cloud, through web APIs in near real time to any device, right? If the device is capable. Um, or we can push through a service from a database to Sysamio and we connect. So the cycle is simple. The first cycle is this model needs to initiate and we say, okay, okay, tell us what is in this world of ours. 
And let's start here with the ERP. The ERP is most probably one of the most important sources. And we get the orders, the bill of material, the routings, the material master, everything comes from the ERP system. Most probably the next important one is the, if there's a manufacturing execution system, because it will say to us, what is the current whip? What is the current task on the machine? And what is the status of this machine? Then there will be an, an IoT device like a tank that will say, what is the tank level, the temperature? If there's AGVs running around, they will say, well, this is the task I'm doing and this is where I'm at, right? An AI algorithm for preventative maintenance will say, well, all machines are good or I predict the failure of that machine five hours from now and so forth. You, you will hit the button automatically or manually and Simeo will run and it will send back to the ERP. Here are the scheduled orders now and the material requirements per operation when this is going to happen, right? So for your procurement department, guys, you need to make sure this material is in warehouse to be picked and staged by then. It will send the actual job list with start and end times and actual equipment, equipment level detail to the MES. It will send the next task and instructions of pickup, drop off and time to the AGV or robotic equipment and so forth, right? So now if a human is still in the loop, the human interacts with the digital twin and no longer with a massive data in an Excel sheet. And the human can now make you know, intelligent decisions on what to do and what options you know, are available and let the digital twin get all the data, do the math and come up with the answer. Hit the submit button and that's the plan. Now that process can be manually driven by a human at first, which you typically do because you know, until everybody gets their ducks in a row and you get all the tra training done and the data issues sorted out, you, you, need, you need a human there to push the button, the button and decide that the plan is good. But then at some point, this can be a fully autonomous process, right? So, so this is the beauty of, and, and I believe you guys are building some similar mo models for, for certain case studies. So I, I, I just try to create the picture in your minds is if you, if you visualize that model being the center of the system orchestrating execution on very complex shop floors. Simio thrives the higher the complexity, right? It really thrives because then basically everything else fails, right? And I, I, can, I can say that because we've been there and done that, right? So from a simplistic point of view, if you look at a simple you know, um, um, production line here and you've got customers, you know, there's always some variation in demand. And then it goes through the different stages of manufacturing. Now, again, I said that today, 95% of factories, there's humans planning it. Now, because it's so complex, they divide the plans. And each of the sort of departments are planned separately. So there's a planning team for the preparation part. There's one for component built. There's one for assembly or whatever the factory is. Now, the issue with that is they have meetings and try and synchronize. But the fact is, it's very hard to do in an Excel sheet, which means that sort of problem escalates down the line until you completely clog the end of the system, which results in a constant firefight, right? Um, by humans running around, you know, people yanking orders off the line, changing priorities because the most important customer are screaming and, and so forth. Everybody knows knows that story. So from a digital twin perspective, once you look at the entire end-to-end -end process, you can make sure that you do not prepare parts that you cannot put in the components and assemble to go pack and ship. So you reduce the variability as far as possible. You'll see that these lines are not flat because you know machines break, there's quality issues, people get sick and go home. It, it, it'll always be there, but as long as you can keep it under control and predictable, you're good, right? You can predict a certain performance. 
so you can manage the constraints synchronize the flow of all of the operators tools transport and and, and so forth all of the, the labor skills and then actually give a give a prediction as to when to do the maintenance based on the maintenance rules right because otherwise the maintenance guy says okay monday morning i shut it down no 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 don't you, can you do it monday afternoon you know but there's no way of of today in the current environment to determine when is the best time to shut the line down right but in some year we actually produce based on the rules the predictive maintenance schedules as as well right so how do you implement this it sounds like it sounds cool i hope right how do we implement this well first first of all just like you guys are using Simia right now you build the models you design them on desktop right and you can run it on desktop you de develop the the, the 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 reports and the dashboards on desktop you can you can do the printouts you can connect the desktop to the the uh, the network and you can send the schedules back to the ERP and to the MES, just as I described before, right from your desktop that is connected to the network. But that's not the most efficient sort of global deploy deployment, right? So the moment your models are st stable, you would deploy it to the cloud, right? And you want it to sit in the cloud and so that everybody can view and see what they need to see depending who, who they are and I'll, I'll go through through that so first of all your planner if he's still a bit nervous to automate and push this all to the cloud you can produce the schedule on on the desktop look at it review and then push it to the cloud then immediately it's available per your access if you're the picker in the warehouse you just get the pick list that you need to pick if you the guy on machine one on the drilling machine one you just get the list of things that you you're gonna um you know drill for the next shift that you're gonna work on if you're a third party per person that need to deliver material or a truck to take finished goods you can get your schedule in real time as to when you need to pick up what need to deliver what right then all your viewers can move to the cloud then if your model if the planner signs off on the model you can actually move the model to the cloud as well and the schedulers can now schedule virtually right they can sit anywhere they can sit at the airport and schedule the plant that is in fiji and japan right it's as as easy as that which then opens the next frontier for us right which says oh but if i make toothpaste or mouthwash or whatever i do it in 20 factories across the world i've got a planning team of 10 people per factory but you know guess what i can push connect all of the data to the cloud i can put all the models on the cloud i can put all the schedulers and viewers as well as the global experimenters of the data analyst and the the ie group the industrial engineering group and they can work with any factory in the world and i can connect it globally through a let's say it's sap the cloud integration platform to sap and also to any other enterprise system database what whatever and now we can do centralized planning and scheduling in near real time of any fact factory centralized All right now there's almost no one that's here yet so this big picture is sort of futuristic but we've got a handful of customer customers that we in the process of deploying this right we've got like two or three factories and that's on the cloud and they starting to run it on the cloud and it's integrated to 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 sap right so we are there's a handful of major fortune um 100 customers that we are in the process of deploying exactly this right but it's a handful right so so this is really for some most companies still a bit pie in the sky but that's you know where, where we are so just final here as a summary and then i'll stop i've been going a long time i don't even check the clock because i i want to make sure i i give you the whole picture here 
is the value. It's this visualization and analyze the production process, current or future. Standardizing of data and systems. Guys, this is a huge issue. Most probably the longest pole in the tent, the single biggest constraint is this data and system standardization. Whatever you want to do, if you call a digital twin, you say, can I see the data? Oh dear, there's a problem, right? Then harmonize people and process. This is another big thing. You'll see that people work differently between shifts in the same factory because of the experience and where they come from and worked with before. You see that people work differently in different factories that's identical because they believe to do it differently works better. So once you have this digital twin, you can standardize the best practices across all of your factories, which means if you move people and things and items between factories, it is all the same, right? And then you can accurately predict the future performance, right? Then the next one, when you connect it, is to create these schedules that are accurate down to task and material item level, right? Extremely valuable. And then, you know, things change. People expand the factories, new customers, new items, marketing wants to run a promotion. There's all these things that come and messes in your factory, right? And this model allows you to tell marketing, guys, if, if you want to run a million of these little small sample packs, this is what it's going to mean for the other orders in the factory, right? And you can tell them that before it hits the factory floor, right? So tremendous value in this whole approach, both from before you, you throw the slab for the building until you do a marketing campaign for the next new great toothpaste, you know, that you want to push out, out there. So there's some case studies which we can can get into, but first I see there's one question in the chat, Jeff. I don't know if, if you can. Yeah, yeah. There's one question, and and I promise you, Garrett, I did not plant this question. This was a this was a a, a uh, question from one of our audience members. It says, "Is cross-platform standardization of data the largest barrier to adoption of Simio or similar planning systems in industry?" Correct, correct. So um, data. Is is the is the single? I mean, they need to understand the process, what they want to do, and and and. But 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 all of that fails with data. But the beauty is, doesn't matter what, they can look left, they can look right, they can look up or down. If they want to get to any smart factory operations, they have to fix the data, right? They have to fix the data. If you interconnect these machines. And there's no standard sort of namespace where you can translate it, right? So you don't have to go make the data the same everywhere, but you have to be able to translate it so that the language is the same and everybody understands what is meant by this thing or that everybody knows that two minutes, what two minutes mean, right? That's huge. So if you, if you put your industry 4.0 hat on and you move to automation, you need to fix the data problem. And, and what the digital twin, it enables you to systematically work your way through that, understand where the issues are, because there's, there's process change involved, there's training involved, there's systems change involved, um, and so forth, right? Because today, a lot of these systems are batch systems. They run overnight, right? And some systems are real time. So if I'm at 10 a.m. in the morning and I say, I want to run Simeo now. Okay, the data doesn't carry the same timestamp. Some data are like six hours old. They're not valid anymore, right? The system is only going to run the batch job overnight today, right? So as we move for forward, into more modern systems like the new S4, SAP S4 HANA is in real time, right? So if I if I query the ERP now, I get I get the data now, right? So the data management in terms of level of detail, the quality of the data or the, the correlation of data in terms of the actual values, as well as the timestamp that the data 
carries when I want to create the schedule at time now is the critical factors of making it work, regardless of how fantastic, unbelievable your model is, it is moot if the data is wrong. So. Uh, yep. Thank, thanks, Garrett. So I'd say with the case studies, you might have gone a little over what I asked you to do. So why don't you pick your favorite one and just spend a couple minutes on it and then we'll wrap up there. Okay. So, um, uh, so, so let me look at this one. So this is a, a company, a global consumer goods company that makes toothpaste, which I'm sure most of you use. They are most probably the, the largest. And um, the issue they have is that due to all sorts of reasons, right? Any given factory, it is really, it boggles my mind. When I walked in there into the training room, and they had all the possible skews, meaning tubes of toothpaste that you can pick from. It's, I don't want to give you exact numbers, but it's somewhere between 600 and 700 different tubes of toothpaste that a factory needs to make in, in a week or a two week period, right? It is flip top, screw top. It is small tube, long tube, plastic tube, metal tube. It is language specific. It is whatever. Some countries don't want any product if every, any of the ingredients was sourced in the United States. Right? Um, there are the weirdest constraints that you can not even come up with if you if you sit in Starbucks the whole day as to why there are more than six hundred types of toothpaste tubes that needs to be made. Now. Some has got a green stripe and a blue stripe and a red stripe, and some has got mouth, you know, mouth freshener and tooth whitener. And, and, and now you can just think of the complexity. They all have different viscosities. They can be pumped to just limited distances based on the viscosity. So from any mixer, you cannot pump to all tanks, and from all tanks, you cannot pump to all filling lines. The tubes are made in real time in line. Um, they are pre printed in the right language and size and 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 these tubes are filled at like 20 per second um the synchronization of this whole thing is just beyond what any human can can do right so um you know a, a, a great sort of example where we sort of increase throughput dramatically by synchronizing all of these complexities in a single model to produce a feasible schedule for the whole factory end to end giving the complexities you know that i just uh, this the, the, the described so the payback um, of the project was about one week right so one week of increase in throughput paid for the project so if you look at the 20 mil million you can sort of if you take out your calculator see what the project cost right but um the ROI is less than one month but it was sort of um in in the one week you know range so uh, just just sh short and sweet uh jeff yeah and i will say that uh being uh seeing this project peripherally uh, i never walk down the toothpaste aisle in the grocery store the same uh, after seeing uh, how this project worked out and all of those details that Garrett talked about. Yep. So yeah, Garrett, let's stop there. We have all the slides and um, if it, does anyone, before I close it, does anyone have any other, any additional questions for Garrett? I have a question. Okay, ask away. So Mr. Zaman, thank you very much for your talk. It was very intriguing. Uh, I have a question. So in the context of this presentation, like, cloud was defined as on-site hosting, right? It wasn't really online. It wasn't on the web. Correct. You are, you're absolutely correct. And um, I'll put a bit of explanation to that. It is today, most of the fortune type com companies mm -hmm. see production planning as core to their business. And they really just don't trust the SaaS environment or the web or like Microsoft Azure to put their operations planning tool outside of their firewall. 
All right. That is changing, right? So, so we can run on Microsoft Azure. We can run on the Amazon cloud. It's not an issue for us. Um, but the companies, the, the, the Procter & Gamble's, the Colgate's, the buyers of this world says no way, right? It, it sits behind our own firewall. So, so, you know, some of the smaller enterprises that does not want to have the cost of an IT company and this, all of this cost, they are happy to put it on the, on the um, you know, uh, uh, public cloud. Mm -hmm. But most of the f f f fortune companies today just won't go there. So just it's mostly a security concern at this point. Absolutely. So that was my next question. So uh, I speculate that there are additional costs involved with de developing and deploying an IT infrastructure on the good local network with scalability capabilities within the premises of the facility so that different services can consume this centralized data uh, after planning and scheduling, right? Yeah, so it's not as complicated actually, right? It's, it's really the, the semio portal is fairly lightweight. Um, mm -hmm. The server that it requires or not like uh, earth sh shattering. And most of the integration today is through web, web API, you know, if it's modern system. So we pull directly from, from SAP or directly from the IoT device. The mm -hmm. companies tend to create their own sort of data persistence layers or data lakes, which is which is sort of separate from Simeo. It helps us if those exist, but it's not a requirement, right? So the, the, the infrastructure to deploy Simeo on cloud, we we actually, you know, I don't want to get into sales and marketing necessarily, but our site license for Simeo includes the cloud, right? So you can you can run it unlimited and have as much access to it as you want for that site for a single fee, right? And you can deploy it on public cloud, you can deploy it on, on your own infrastructure, you can host your own hardware, you can buy hardware, because you can run on, on Microsoft Azure hardware, but not on the Azure cloud, right? So that is also possible. I see. It, it would be very interesting to see like what can happen once these security concerns are addressed, so that like maybe uh, I'm saying just, just an idea, in the future we'll have like cross-factory communication, cross-factory scheduling and things like that. Absolutely. So, okay. Very really interesting. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. But the security is still is still the the obstacle there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Garrett? Okay. Uh, I would just finish. First of all, uh, thank you, Garrett. Uh, thank you very much for that informative presentation. Uh, and I would just tell our class here that, you know, the models that we've been doing, are, they might seem far away from the models that Garrett's talking about, but they're really not. Uh, we're, we've dealt with simple constraints, but incorporating those more complicated constraints is just more data and a little bit more logic, but the basic structure is the exact same. And then finally, to kind of finish up with this, I have Simeo Portal running on one of my computers. And on uh, one of our Q&A sessions, I'm happy to spin that up and show you how easy it is to take one of your models, put it in portal, and then that transfer from the portal on my computer to portal that's running in the cloud is simple. Uh, it's just, it's not a technology problem. It's a, you know, data uh, proprietariness and, and security problem. It's not a technology problem. So I'm, I'm happy to show that. So um, as I mentioned, uh, I wanna talk just for about three minutes or four minutes about case study five. Uh, and then I'll let you guys go. Garrett, you're welcome to stay, but if you do stay, then you have to do the case study. So. No, no, no. I'll, 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 uh, will great graciously depart at this point. So okay. thank you, thank you very, very much. I hope, I hope it was of value. Thanks, Garrett. It was great. We, uh, we'll touch base tomorrow. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Okay. So as as I said, let me just spend a couple of minutes here. Hopefully, you guys read this. I just want to talk about two or three things here. And then I'm, uh, we're going to talk about this in the Thursday Zoom uh, Q&A session. I've got a couple of technical issues I want to talk about then too. And then I will, of course, answer any questions that you have. If you can't make it to that, send me an email. I'll have to be happy to go over it. So you can see case study five. The, the, the couple of things I want to mention here. One is that you can do this individually or in groups of two. Um, as I mentioned in the document, if you do it in groups of two, my expectations are higher. So there's really no penalty for working alone. Uh, but I think there's um, there's benefit also in working groups of two. 
basically the only change from the, the uh, baseline model in case study four to this model in case study five is that we're introducing work schedules. So for the baseline model, everything else is the same. And so you also note that the scenario files for case study five are in the exact same format. So all of the data that you use for case study four, you can also use for your development of case study five. Uh, we have not yet finished the data files for case study five, but hopefully we'll have those by the end of the week uh, or beginning of next week. But all of the test data uh, that, that you already have, uh, you can use. And so let me again just suggest that one thing that is a deliverable here is a verification report. And so if I were in your shoes, the very first thing I would do is take my case study four model, implement the, the schedule, and then work on that verification because the major deliverable for this case study is experimentation and, and testing. And so you do not wanna get three quarters of the way through task two and figure out that you have a bug in your model and all of your results are invalid. And so since you have to turn in a verification report, the, the most efficient way of proceeding is to spend the time now doing the verification so that you can be confident that, um, uh, that your models are working correctly because as I'm sure you've seen, especially if you've been paying attention to the discussion boards on Canvas, a lot of people run into pretty small errors that are kind of difficult to find. Uh, and so you wanna make sure you capture all, or you find as many of those as possible uh, early on, okay? So I'm gonna leave it at that unless anyone has any questions. Uh, uh, and then we'll pick this back up in our, um, in our uh, uh, session on Thursday. And again, if you can't make the session on Thursday, that's fine, just send me an email and I'll be happy to discuss. Anything for me? So uh, I don't know if I can ask a question about the dashboards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Let me, I, got, I think I might have to let you, but hold on a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can share your screen now. You should be able to. Oh, give me a sec now. So my question is about the dispatch dashboard that you shared with us. So in that dashboard, do we we have some pie charts where we said that we can see there like the utilization of mm -hmm. each resource. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I found out is like what they are doing actually is to sum in the time that the resource were busy and divided by the max span. Okay. The issue is like with the change over operator uh -huh. when we have two. Um, units of capacity uh -huh. in that dashboard, they don't consider that two units of capacity, you know, because then the available time is gonna be two times. So that, I just found that thing, that's why that uh, like BC time of the change over operator is different than the schedule utilization in the pivot grid of the result. Okay. Yep. I'm just gonna check if it, what I'm saying it's true. Or what I you're saying is definitely true. Okay. <laughs> what to do about it? I don't know. That's what I want you to tell me. What you were saying I is definitely true. I already figured true. what to do. I already figured what to do, but um, but I was like, I, I, it took me time just to realize why we don't have like exactly because actually what I was thinking is okay if I sum all the time these and they, you know, like divided by two times the. The, the make a span, then I'm going to get the same schedule utilization, but also it's, it, it didn't work that way with the log table that they used. Yeah. But, so well, I just want to share that just in case someone else is taking a look of that dashboard. Yeah, again, so, let me point out again that the, the, that, the, the automatically built dashboards like the one you're talking about, I mean, it's no panacea. You know, it's not yeah. going to solve every problem that you have. And the key is understanding what it tells you is you've already done. And so now you have to figure out, is there a way that I can fix that in the dashboard? Or maybe I just don't include a dashboard with that information. But that's definitely what you point out is definitely true of that dashboard. Okay. And as you're going to see, you're going to see there's a similar problem. I'll talk about Thursday when you start implementing schedules, you know, okay. so you're going to see that and I'll discuss that on Thursday. But that's that's definitely true. Okay. That would be it. Thank you. Anything else for me today? Okay, uh, thank you all for attending uh, and I will see you or talk to you at least on Thursday. Thanks. Thank you.